Welcome to the Find Your Voice, Change Your Life podcast with psychologist Dr. Doreen Downing. Listen in as Doreen interviews people who felt they didn't have a voice or who suffered extreme speaking anxiety. You'll hear stories about how they struggled to speak up, what they did to find their authentic voice, and the confidence they now feel to speak up and make an impact. If you want to get started right away to find your voice, download Doreen's free 7-Step Guide to Fearless Speaking at Doreen7Steps.com. And now, here is Doreen. Hi, I'm Dr. Doreen Downing. I'm a psychologist and I'm host of the Find Your Voice, Change Your Life podcast. Every week I invite somebody here and usually they have a story about not having had a voice somewhere along their journey to growing up. Sometimes it's early in life. Sometimes it happens when they try and enter the workforce. Sometimes it's when they actually are starting their own business and they've never had to kind of get out and talk about themselves and use their own voice, their passion. So today I get to interview E.A. Sokovitz, and he's founder and patriarch of the Givers University, and I can't wait to hear about that at some point today, E.A. The goal of Givers University is providing increased happiness, freedom, and greatness through personal, business, social, and family development. I think that says so much and so little. Thank you so much for being here today, E.A. Well, well, thank you, uh, Doctor, for having me uh, on your great podcast. And uh, I knew you were a smart lady because you have more letters after your name than I have letters in my last name. So I, think, <laughs> so I figured, and, uh, and, and, and I think it's great that we can share with people and, and the importance of having a voice. And uh, so thank you so much for having me on. Yes, well, already I feel that there's a lightness about your spirit, and it feels like who's ever listening, get prepared, because we're going to have a playful time today, <laughs> <laughs> even though it can be serious. So let's, let's start with your sense of not having had a voice, what that was, when that was in your life. Uh, well, actually, uh, you know, I, my upbringing was very humble. My uh, father was a milkman, lived in Chicago. And, uh, you know, you had, and, and back then milk came in uh, glass containers and, uh, you know, there was a box outside everyone's door that was called the milkman's box. You know, the funny thing, doctor, is that no, there was always money in the box and no one ever touched it. Not one time. I mean, a little different times, right? But, uh, and uh, so they had, you know, glass containers and I was five years old and I'd help my father. So it was very humble upbringing. Nothing unusual about, you know, one man operation, a milkman, delivery man, literally with his own truck kind of thing. And, uh, and, and I always felt like inside I wanted to do something special and I wanted to do, but I, I didn't even know where to start, wh who to talk to, what to do. Uh, you know, I mean, it just, it just felt like there was a, there was a hole there. It was like an emptiness that even at a young age that I, I wanted to do something and I could see, you know, other people that were successful and I just started, whether it was on TV or me, you know, just sort of see them at distance. And I said, man, I really like that, you know, but. I don't even know how in the world do you even get there or how do you, you know, I didn't even know what I didn't know, you know, as a point to start with. And then uh, at the ripe old age of 16, uh, I started to go in that direction. And because of two real unusual events, uh, both of which uh, I hope are important information for your listeners. The first one is at 16 years old, I was able to be bonded, which means basically insured. So as a, I was be, I was a janitor then and so that meant if my buffer hit something or a piece of equipment, insurance company would pay for it. Because of being bondable, I was also able to be in really expensive houses. And there was a house of a lady I cleaned every single Wednesday. Uh, when I say her name, it won't mean anything to your listeners until I make the movie reference. Uh, there was a movie out fairly recently, um, and it'll probably be for years ago because it's actually a pretty good view. It's called The Founder. Uh, it's about McDonald's. Uh, it's uh, Ray Kroc. Michael Keaton plays Ray Kroc. Um, and, and, and I lived in that area. I lived in the greater Oak Brook area. So I, you know, and, and so here I am as a janitor. And there's a late in the movie, Michael Keaton, who plays Ray Kroc, which, by the way, Ray was not that way. In the beginning of the movie, it says based on a true story. It's based on a true story, but it's not the true story. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was totally different. And, and Ray wasn't the way he's portrayed. That's Hollywood drama and spin, right? But in any event, 
in the movie, Michael Keaton, Ray Kroc, is constantly talking to a lady outside his office. That lady, her name is June Martino. That lady is the lady who house I cleaned every single Wednesday. And so here I am, doctor, as a 16-year-old, I'm in this million-dollar home. At, and this is, I was 16, it was a million-dollar home. She's got a full-time maiden butler and a Rolls-Royce in the garage and bought uh, homes for her sons. And she was an icon in the area. Everyone knew who June Martino was at the point I met her. Um, and she had the third most controlling stock in McDonald's. And, and when she walked through the room, I, the thing I was amazed was this woman was so nice and easy to talk to. She, she seemed so approachable. So easy to talk to, uh, you know, I mean, just was never condescending to anyone. Always said hi to me, even if I was looking down buff on the floor and she walked through. She said hi if I didn't even look up. And I thought, man, what's the deal with this? You know, I, you know, I'd like to be prosperous and I'd like to have a million dollar home and, you know, and, and the Rolls Royce and all these things. And I'd like to have people know who maybe know who I am kind of thing or do something great. And certainly, you know, everyone knew who McDonald's was at that point. And uh, so one day I just asked her. I said, uh, could you tell me about it? And she put her arm around me, brought me in the kitchen, and the entire day told me the entire McDonald's story. And the point of this whole story was she specifically mentioned to me the importance that Ray had on her life. And that was, you know, and I didn't know what mentor was. I, I didn't even know how to spell it. You know, I, I think I spent my hooked on phonics money on something else, you know, and it wasn't on uh, spelling. So, so here, so, it, but she told me about this impact. And I thought, man, you know, if I could just meet a Ray Kroc or someone that could put me under their wing, I could, first of all, learn what I don't even know. I just, all I know is I don't know it. I don't even know what to ask. I don't know what I should be doing. I just know I think there's something I want to do, but man, I need some guidance on this. And and uh, I wasn't, and I just sort of threw it out there, doctor. And I, and that's what I tell people. You know, I said we need to be careful of the questions we ask in life, and the questions are usually much more important than the answers. Uh, and so I uh, inadvertently asked the right question. I said, "Where's my Ray Kroc? Where would I meet him?" And okay, couple, before you before you yep. go on, that's yep. uh, with the story. I want to stay a little bit longer because that's what people hear you first having had this struggle and that feels like you had a dream you had a vision and there was not a structured path and a lot of times in our education you know it's not like we're taught to how to go for what we see or what we want we're taught the abcs you know how to get the grades so just say a little bit more for our listeners about the struggle of wanting something and just how it didn't feel like you can get it. It was like a dichotomy. You know, I felt I, I had the I had a dream and I, I was dreaming, you know, and, and I always felt like even when I was at June's house, you know, I, I would clean the I would clean the garage twice. So I got to sit in the Rolls Royce twice and pull it out of the garage. So and what and in my mind, I played with my own mind thinking, wow. This is what if this was my Rolls Royce? You know, I'm sitting in a car that's worth you know, ten lifetimes of my income. So I, I, I the dichotomy was I, I sort of would walk down these dream. I was in her son's houses she bought for houses, and and it was all this wealth all over the place. You know, and 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 there was happiness. And I I learned later on that you know I, that you know that my quest in early age was the opposite of what it should have been. You know, I at 16 years old I was about the money. You know, and you know it's about the you know, and, and so many times we're taught, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know get, go meet someone and, you know, get a career, make a lot of money, meet someone and live happily ever after. And I found out that that, that was backwards and we should live happy ever after first. And then all those other things can come when the time is right, but we should be living happily ever after. And oh, I, I like that. I like that statement. I, w I just want it, people to hear that again, to yeah. live happily ever after, right here, right now. It's not like some some future fantasy that you're trying to get yourself to. It It's possible to have happiness right here, right now. Before you go on, could you say just a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to because the, you know, it, Again, you know, at, at a ripe old at ripe old age of sixteen, you know, I'm just I'm seeing all this wealth, and I want to do this, and I think, you know, and I and I know it was drilled into me, you know, you go to school, get an education, meet someone, then you're gonna get, you know, get a career, and you're happily ever after, and 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 I didn't realize till later on in life that, you know, that that happiness was a choice, and 
uh, and, and to not be, and, and as my business mentor shared with me, he said, happiness is not the absence of stress. It's the proper management of it. And he said, you're going to be tackled a thousand times in your lifetime. At all ages, all through your whole life, you're going to be tackled at different times. How you manage that will have a direct impact. Well, there you go question. again. You're, you're just coming up with these gems <laughs> of wisdom. <laughs> so make sure and slow down so we can take it all in. That uh, our happiness is, is about how we manage stress. Wonderful. Thank you for yep opening that up a little bit more. You're welcome. And, and I apologize because I can really get talking fast. You know, you know, 200 words a, a minute would gust to 70 miles an hour when I get going. So I know, I know. I apologize I... for that. You know, they, you know, I just went the So the, so, and these are all things. And by the way, what was so important is this is why I became an advocate so strongly for having a Dr. Doreen in your life or having a coach, or having a mentor, or someone that can help guide you, because there's a reason in the football games that the coach is on the sidelines. There's a reason he's not standing next to the guy, the guy, the quarterback. If he's standing next to the quarterback, he'd see the same thing he's seeing. And, and all that is is a bunch of guys get ready to tackle him, right? But the coach stands on the side for a reason. <laughs> there you go again. <laughs> So he can he can see the whole perspective. Yes. He can see the whole game, yes. and and then offer. Hey, did you see this? And did you see that? And look for that guy in the right. He's getting ready to tackle you. You know, I mean. So the and and we that other perspective. So I became because of my mentor, a huge advocate of having a mentor because if you don't have one, all we're doing is just setting ourselves up for making mistakes we don't have to make. It's almost like we're making this choice by default to make mistakes when when there are people that want to guide us and help us that have done it, not just people that say they know how to do it, but people that genuinely know how to do it. And and I submit to you and your listeners, there's a succinct difference. You know, uh, be selective as to your mentor is. But then once you have them and you have been discerning, listen to them. And mine, you know, I was fortunate at an early age, right when I, after I met this June Martino lady at you know, 16 from, at 16. Uh, it wasn't a couple months later. We got this phone call at the office at the janitorial service. And this guy was in from Michigan that uh, wanted to open a diamond store and needed to see some carpeting. And I met him and he offered me a job and he became the father I never had, even though I had a father and I became the son he never had, even though he had a son. And he truly was my mentor. And uh, and a, a, a puritanical genius, you know, not the book kind of genius, but I mean, really the kind of person that could look at you, I call it human 101 engineering genius. You know, he, he could look at someone, talk with them for five or 10 minutes, ask them a couple of questions, look them in the eye, and he'd nail exactly what kind of person they were. And to my astonishment for decades, I saw that, you know, um, and, and so he was my mentor and I was very blessed because he helped with that dichotomy I had, doctor, that I have the dreams, I have the feeling that I want to do something. I want to have a voice. I, I want to you know, be a part of something that's bigger than me, but I don't know how to do it and, and I don't know what to ask. And so I started asking him, I said, you know, I want to do this. Could you, could you teach me everything? And, and I'm going to jump way for, way backwards, way forward, and way backwards in like two sentences. We're warned. Okay. At, yeah. At 19 <laughs> years old, I said, Sam, will you teach me everything? Just teach me it all. I don't care what it is. Just I don't want you to hold back. I need to know it all. Because I had realized my superpower, doctor, was not to be the smartest person in the room, but the guy that could say, you know, that's really interesting. Could you teach me about that? I don't know about that. You know, and I think everyone today is so interested in being preeminent and that makes people nervous about finding their voice because they think, you know, am I going to look smart enough? I got news for you. That's, in my opinion, that's not the way to do it. You're much stronger to be a person who says, wow, that's really interesting. Could you teach me about that? And we learn and we learn and we go forward. So my mentor, I asked him, could you teach it all to me? And he said, okay, I will, but I want one thing from you. He said, when the time is right, and you will know that time. I want you to teach as many people as you possibly can everything I teach you. So at 19 years old, I made a vow. I made an oath 
to my mentor that today has manifest as Givers University. And it was all really, all these things I share are things, uh, you know, the, the, you know, where you're sort of stopping and saying, well, that's a good nugget and that's good. I didn't make up any of that. I'm repeating his words. I'm repeating the things he taught me that I just remember that I, they felt, they, I felt the same way when I heard him. I thought, man, that is really great stuff. And I'd, I'd ponder the, the sentence, you know, because I realized that I wanted to be happy. And, and, and that the, there was strength in learning how to be happy whether there was a lot of money around me or not. There was strength in learning how to be happy no matter what was happening around me. And he, an example that he used uh, is a great medical example. He said, you know, he said, if you go into the hospital and uh, they say that the patient is reacting to the treatment, that's not good. That means they're, it's not being favorable for them. He said, but if they say they're responding to it, that's good. He said, so let me share with you the difference in life because it's going to have a direct impact on your voice and happiness. He said, do not allow your emotion to rule your intellect. When you do, you're reacting. He said, train yourself so your intellect controls your emotion and you'll always be responding. He said, when you react, watch your happiness go right out the window. He said, when you respond, he said, by, by having your intellect control your emotions, he said, your happiness quotient is going to go up every single day in direct proportion to your ability to do that. Well, I'd love to have you pivot just a teeny bit here. And because emotions is uh, something that a lot of the listeners have around speaking, which is fear. For sure. So let's, let's open that conversation up about fear, emotion, and mind. Great. Uh, and my, again, I just defer back to my mentor because you know, I almost sound like a broken record, but the fact of the matter is, number one, it's not broken. And, and number two, the fact that uh, you know, the things he shared with me, I tested them and they really did work. And, and, and one of the things he shared with me in the distinction of givers and takers, um, first I share with your listeners, we love everybody. I say that emphatically. We love everybody. And one of the things we do, we teach, because I'm actually answering your question, but I never say it in 10 minutes if I can say it in 20, so I apologize for that. But the, so, but the difference, but what he teaches is follows, and it is a direct impact on fear. And that is, we teach people to love everyone, but how to separate the person who we love from their deeds, which we may not love. And then by giving them, we actually have checklists that we teach people on. Here's a checklist of things you should be watching that people do. Don't listen to what they're saying. Watch what they're doing. Watch their deeds. Because our talk our, our, our talk talks and our walk talks, but our walk talks louder than our talk talks. <laughs> so watch what people do. Watch their deeds. So we teach this so that when you see people doing certain, observe it. It's a skill. When we see them do certain things, now we think, should I pull them in closer into my life because I have what I'm seeing, make them a part of what we call our giver, my giver community? Or should I begin respectfully, not rude or insensitive or nasty, respectfully distancing myself from them because, if I, because of what I'm seeing? If I bring them in closer, they're going to make me collateral damage. And when I, they make me collateral damage... Now my fear comes in and I'm afraid to give. I'm afraid to participate because I feel they may be taking advantage of me. And that leads us to the next step of fear. Here's the part. My mentor said, if you want this happiness in life thing to work for you, picture in your mind this huge scale. He said, we're going to call it the giver's life scale. He said, on the right side, all the things you're going to get in your life, all the things you're going to receive, all the things you're going to get. He said, on the left side, all the things you're going to give and when you're going to contribute and give. He said, now, what's amazing about the scale is it strives for balance. In fact, it's never out of balance, even if it seems like it's out of balance for a static moment. He said, it always balances itself. He said, now, the next thing I share with you will be a little challenging for you, but you'll get it if you stay in there. He said, forget about the right side. Forget about what you're going to receive and make it your daily goal to heave so much on the left side, the giving side of the scale, that your goal is to try to get that scale out of balance because you've put so much on that side. And he said, you'll never have to worry 
about what you get on the right side. It'll always be there. And he said, here's the part with people and with giving that makes people fearful in so many ways. He said, you know, people are saying, well, you know, I don't want to give to someone because what if they take advantage of me, right? What if they take advantage of me and I'm going to be diminished? He said, here's the part. Let me explain how this works. He said, when you're a giver, people will take advantage of you. Expect it. Mm -hmm. But here's the second part of the sentence no one gets or is ever told. When you're a giver, people will take advantage of you. Expect it. But you are never diminished because they did. They are diminished because they did. He said, that's the distinction no one gets. He said, because with the giver's life scale, when your job is just to get the scale out of balance, he said, you don't have to worry about the fact. He said, first of all, if they take advantage of you, they're diminished. You're not diminished. They are. So he said, keep that in your mind. And he said, when you get, when you start to get a, your sea legs in this and you start to get a feel for it, he said, you're not going to be as afraid and you're going to be more comfortable because you're going to realize they lose you. They lost the relationship when they do these things. So you're going to be more comfortable and you won't be as afraid. You won't be as afraid. You won't be afraid to communicate with people or to have your voice or to speak with others because you're going to realize you're going, you're winning no matter what you're doing the right thing as long as you're giving. So expect people to take advantage of you, get your head around it. It's so get, then get rid of the fear and know that the scale will always be in balance somehow from another person, another circumstance, you're going to get, the good things that you gave out. Well, the what I'm also taking from this around voice and around uh, speaking is that in terms of that scale you're talking about, it's the more you show up as the giver that you're talking about and speaking from that place, it empowers you. That's what I hear. Yes. And 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 an important next step. I, I was very fortunate uh, I, you know, I had a radio show in years past and I interviewed 1,000, 1,000, over 1,000 millionaires in two years. And I was looking for, doctor, the, the common threads. You know, why these people, why did they make a million dollars? And even today, even with inflation and everything, if you add someone's, most people's income together of their whole lifetime, it still isn't quite a million dollars. So why, and I'm thinking, you know, so I wanted to find out why, what, what's so unusual about these people? Why did these these thousand plus people, men and women, why did they do? How did they do that? What what are the common threads? And there were some very fascinating things, and they all had a story where they felt like they had lost their voice. They all, not some, not mo the majority, all of them had a time where they said everything seemed as though it had turned against them their family, their friends, business, the economy, the political situation, the list was endless, but they all had the story. And what was interesting, doctor, is that the next part, now these are people, you know, over two years, different industries, different backgrounds, didn't know each other. Some of them even used the same words with the next thing I'm about ready to say. They said, do you know, I took the next step when everything told me not to. Just in some instance, some of them said, just to see if there was anything else that could go wrong. <laughs> they said, I was wondering if I missed anything. Is it possible I missed anything? Because I think I hit it all. And they said it was it was almost like a weird, morbid fascination. You know, is there anything else that could possibly go wrong? And they all, doctor, not some of them, that's an important distinction, all of them took that next step when they felt they had lost that voice and everything they had worked for. And when they took that next step, they said it was amazing what happened next. It was like this invisible temporary defeat in their life just exited. And it said, you know what? This man or woman doesn't know when to give up. I'm just going to go and goof up someone else's life because obviously these people aren't thrown in the towel. This is too hard. And they said, in spite of themselves, things started working out. So that taught me, doctor, the importance of being willing when you lose your voice and you feel the journey is so difficult. Be willing to do the next step. If you really are committed to your dream and your why is in place, why you're doing it, 
take that next step, do that next step, no matter how it looks, and, and then get ready to be astonished in how it works out. Oh, I love that phrase. Get ready to be astonished at your own self, your own voice, and the courage to step is, is what I hear rather than just staying stuck. We're almost out of time, so I want to obviously get uh, your contact information because you have so much wisdom and so much more to say, I'm sure. How do people contact you? Thank you, doctor. Um, they actually just go to Givers University. It's plural, giversuniversity.com. Um, and they should sign up for our newsletter. It's free. We don't spam people. They're going to immediately get an email that says, do you want to talk to these people? They have to say yes. When they do that, two hours later, they're going to get one of the most impressive checklists they will ever see. It's a checklist on 20, we call it the 25 do's. These are the things to watch for. I referenced before the deeds to watch for with people. These are, these are the 25 deeds to look for that givers will do, and that takers will do. And remember, we don't label people, we're labeling deeds. We have giver deeds and taker deeds. We don't call people takers, we don't label people, but we, we observe their deeds, there's a distinction. So they'll get this free checklist and then every week, because we don't spam people, you know, I hate that. You sign up for something and you're getting six emails a day from them and I unsubscribe, unsubscribe, right? So once a week on Thursday morning, they're gonna get something that's called the giver's toolbox. It's a four or five minute read usually has maybe a two minute little video clip in it. And it's a tool that week that can help them that they can add into their relationship toolbox to have a happier, more prosperous life. And that's every Thursday morning. And they from that, they find out who we are and our courses and all that. And, and, and our job, doctor, is real simple. Our job, and we are bound to determine to get that scale out of balance by putting everything we need to put on the left side. And uh, we'd love to have them participate and, and just get the tools that we have because we want them to use them because we know it'll come back to us in so many ways. We're happy to do it. Yeah. Well, there's so many bits of jeweled uh, mirrors, beautiful little sayings that we've gotten today from you. And, you know, I know you say that, oh, well, it was just what I heard from my mentor. And so, yes, it's important to find somebody that you can uh, imitate, let's say, to start with. But what I get from you is that you're fully embodied with all this knowledge, this information, this passion, and you're really excited about sharing it. You are a giver. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Thank you for being with us today for this episode of Find Your Voice, Change Your Life. Each person during interviews shares what has helped them find their voice. You can learn from these guests and find your voice so you can be confident to speak up and speak out. And remember to download Doreen's free seven-step guide to fearless speaking at Doreen7steps.com. We hope you enjoyed the show and we'll return next time. Until then, goodbye for now.